So we're going to finish this chapter today, chapter 13, and then uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, we'll do chapter 14, and then this makes sense to review uh, Thursday. Does that work? Because that's when we're coming anyway. So you can work over the weekend with any questions, and then just uh, send me questions up until uh, the Wednesday before the uh, review. So go back over all your notes and, and see if there's anything that uh, we should go over again. And I'll be able to, the reason I'm asking this is because that way I'll be able to tell the same question is coming up over and over again. That means we probably need to go over again. So that helps me identify. It helps the uh, review session go smoother because we can deal with those questions. And then, of course, I'll be around uh, all the way up until uh, November 8th. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, and so the, the exam is just going to be, I'm going to, that's the other thing. By the end of the week, I'm going to post a uh, model exam and answer. Uh, just, you know, sh there'll be short answers in the essay, and it's sort of based on the problems that we were doing. You don't have to know uh, numbers or anything like that. I don't use numbers, so you can reference them. And you won't, certainly won't need to know numbers for the NPRE as well. The NPRE is a different exam. You're trying to choose the best answer. Uh, this exam, class exam, is just going to be, you know, black letters. No, no tricks or anything based on the, the problems that we've been doing in class. And so we started off with one or two soft classes, and now this class is going to be soft. Not because the material is not important. This is important material, I think, is you should know this as lawyers. We've been in the legal services in Chapter 13, and then Chapter 14 is the state of the professor, so you want to know what you're getting into contextually, so that's important, but it's just not heavily rule driven. The only thing we're really going to talk about in terms of a rule is uh, 6.1. Uh, so, this is a review of our last class. Uh, the last thing we did was the lawyer's responsibility to third parties. And, you know, we've constructed all these things at the beginning of our course. We talked about uh, undivided loyalty to the client, the duty of competence, the collaborative relationship between the attorney as agent and the principal of the client. All those things. So we have this tight connection to our client, but we also have other competing obligations. You know, we have to function under the rules, of course. There's other law that might impact our conduct and a host of other things. And so one of the things that impacts our conduct is our responsibility to the third party, which really tells us that we can't say, and this is runs through um, chapter 12, we can't say I'm representing my client and that's it. I'm going to do everything I can to quote win in quotation marks or, or whatever. You, you have these other obligations. So we know we can't assist our client in fraud. We know we can't make our fraudulent uh, representations to uh, third parties. We know all these things. And so we did that in connection with uh, a number of cases. We did problem 12 too, uh, starting on page 566, uh, uh, the break in. And we looked at a number of things. We looked at 1.2D, we cannot assist the client or engage the client in conduct as a lawyer knows this criminal, so breaking in, are we helping that? We talked about uh, unlawfully obstructing another party's access to justice under 3.4. And we talked about uh, receiving a document inadvertently. And then we also talked about the broad catch all of misconduct. So, so we shall not. We have to know it's criminal conduct, but, but we certainly know that our client broke in. Uh, a lawfully obstruct access to evidence. Uh, promptly notify the sender of inadvertently received evidence. And then uh, the broad conduct of misconduct. destroy this evidence, we said no, of course not. Uh, should we just move forward if the client is willing to take that risk uh, because children are involved? Uh, and we ultimately looked at what happened in the real case. The attorney just showed these documents to the ex-husband attorney, uh, and the attorney was totally surprised. Ex-husband's uh, lawyer was completely unaware, did not ask where the documents came from, and the evil trial agreed to uh, full custody uh, to the mother. Uh, and also, another thing, thing to think about is that probably by this time the girls were ready to testify against the father anyway. Uh, so the lawyer was so shocked that he never even asked where the documents came from. Uh, then we did the prosecutor's masquerade, that's problem 12-3, uh, on page 573. And we looked at whether or not there's some type of emergency exception uh, to save lives under 1.6, and we said that's probably too speculative. Uh, so we wanted to uh, impersonate a public defender, get all the information that we could negotiate, and then solve this crisis. Would there be a violation of the Fifth or Sixth Amendments? Uh, we said no, but we also had a discussion about critical stages and what that meant if that uh, right attaches. Uh, the prosecutor must not uh, seek from a defendant who has no lawyer a waiver of rights, we said. Uh, we made false statements to him. Uh, we, on some level, misled an unrepresented uh, client. And on some level, we also gave uh, legal advice to a unrepresented client. So we noted all those things were problematic. In the real case, the lawyer was suspended, uh, had to retake the NPRE, take 20 hours of CLE on ethics, and he had to have a supervisor present at all times with unrepresented persons and pay the cost of the disciplinary uh, proceedings. He appealed and the Supreme Court affirmed. But there was widespread uh, public support uh, for what he did. Uh, then we talked about the prosecutor as a minister of justice and what that means, not just getting convictions, but making sure this broader notion of fair and equal justice is applied. Uh, and then we, that was pretty much the end of the chapter. But there are two things I want to sort of highlight. On page 580 and 581, we pressed over those. Uh, now, the Michael Brown uh, case in Ferguson uh, really was explosive, and part of that was how the prosecutor handled the case. And it ultimately led to no indictment. And a lot of people criticized the prosecutor for how he handled the case. Some level insulating uh, police conduct and also not making effective uh, assessments of witnesses that he would use to support that indictment. Okay, 580, that's an example of that. Uh, one of the witnesses was Sandra McElroy, uh, and she had uh, significant credibility problems. Uh, and she came forward as a witness in previous cases, uh, but in those previous cases, her testimony was dismissed as a complete fabrication, and she was used in this case. 
uh, and the prosecutor said he admitted that he had used her, and, and he decided that anyone who claimed to have been a witness uh, of anything in Michael Brown case should be presented to the grand jury. So that is not uh, a proper assessment of the prosecutor's role, and it shows that uh, the prosecutor was presenting a witness whose veracity was so doubtful that it may have undermined his efforts to get an indictment. Another case is on page 581. Uh, a distinguished uh, DA, he was a DA in LA, I'm sorry, in Manhattan for over 34 years, uh, Brian Dice Medal winner, uh, but this is a pure politics. Uh, there was a re-election campaign, and this is what happened to Dennis Nightfall when we talked about the uh, Duke case. There was a re-election campaign, uh, and during that time, in the DA's office, it was found that one of the uh, convictions that they got probably uh, was not supported by uh, strong evidence. Uh, and there's an attorney, Daniel Bibb, uh, he uh, brings this up, but he's told to defend the conviction despite evidence clearly exonerating the defendant. The morning thought was in this re-election bid uh, and doesn't want to look weak or like his office makes a mistake. Now, notice what the attorney did. The DA uh, still continued to defend his conviction while also secretly collaborating with uh, defense counsel and telling him uh, what was going on. And uh, so, you see on the top of page 382, uh, he was put in a position to defend convictions that he didn't believe in. And so nothing much came of that, and then uh, the attorney revealed what he'd done. That's on the top of page 582. New York Bar opened an investigation of whether he violated his ethical obligations to his client. Bill resigned from his job. The bar investigates, but eventually does not, without recognizing any uh, discipline. And so, ethics experts, you see in this footnote uh, 112, they split about whether or not this uh, behavior uh, was wrong. So just because someone, one commentator said just because he has a conscience does not mean he can actively subvert his client's case. Others argue that there's a higher purpose and indeed if the prosecutor is a minister of justice, uh, this was something that he had to do. But those are just two more examples of, of lawyer's duties to third parties. And that's the end of that chapter. Now, chapter 13, uh, the provision of legal services. Now, uh, this chapter just sort of looks at where we are in terms of providing access to justice, access to justice. And I mean, when you say access to justice, we're talking about uh, access to systems that resolve disputes, uh, both criminally uh, and civilly. And the book sort of talks about all of this uh, unmet need. And one thing that sort of sticks out is that, you know, we have this constitutional standard, Gideon versus Wainwright, you know, it's over 50 years old. We talk about the criminal defendant's uh, right to counsel that's embedded in our system. But when you have that constitutional right, how do you implement it? There are a lot of limitations in terms of how it's implemented. Because if that is guaranteed to every criminal defendant and the large majority of that population is indigent, how do we provide effective uh, representation? And we've been wringing our hands about this for the last 50 years. We have this constitutional standard, but what does it mean when you have individual attorneys with uh, 300 cases to manage? You know, how many people justice is that? Yes, they have an attorney, uh, but when you have a system that's geared towards uh, pleas and not full exploration of guilt or innocent, uh, what does that constitutional right mean? Getting investment right, right. The other scenario is a civil case. You know, middle, lower, middle class, people who don't have uh, money for an attorney, what do they do? And there's no real constitutional right to counsel in civil cases, but on some level, they impact the liberty interests uh, almost as important in the criminal context. You know, whether family can stay together, whether you can stay in your home, whether you inherit property. Uh, all these things are life-changing interests, but uh, the courts have been very reluctant to recognize uh, a due process right to uh, civil representation. Uh, and you have uh, sort of a, uh, a, a, what we call a welfare state, where you sort of provide benefits to those who cannot uh, achieve them. Uh, what do those benefits mean if no one has them? There's an old law review article that sort of starts this type of discussion. It's called the New Property. In the uh, early 60s, it talks about uh, you know, the administrative state, access to these uh, benefits, uh, and, and what does it mean? We're looking at a case called Goldberg versus Kelly, you may have seen that in constitutional law. But all of these things are, issues that impact upon us. And so, this is also this discussion, and we can start here. What about uh, alternative avenues to uh, legal services? In other words, we are, we're specialists. All of us, you pass the bar, you'll be doing something uh, specialized, uh, and you may not be able to reach all of uh, the clients who need uh, legal representation. How do you feel about sort of uh, non-lawyers providing basic services? Like uh, legal Zoom or filling out things. You don't need to go to law school and uh, pass the bar, just to fill out these forms. How do you feel about that? And then, I'll push back on it. Go ahead, sorry. Um, argument, there's a little self-interest in that argument, a little self-regulated profession, a learned profession, uh, and we don't want many people impacting on what we do. So whether it's a basic thing or a more complex thing, uh, we have something called unauthorized practice of law, and we use that to maintain our monopoly. What about that? That's on page 596. Says uh, felony defendants have a right to counsel, but as I pointed out before, there are limitations 
regardless of case. Look, what about uh, accepting appointments? You see that rule 6.2 on page 597? So it says if a lawyer, say you're just walking through the courthouse, and we know that uh, we have problems with representation, now that lawyers to represent, even legal aid is really busy, you have to be walking down the hall and just say, just says, come here, I want you to work on this criminal uh, defense case. 6.2 accepting appointments, what can you do there? So we're identifying this problem. This chapter takes a broad structural view. Uh, see back on page 594, uh, and this is kind of old statistic. Law is a $100 billion per year industry. But of that $100 billion, only one one hundredth of that is dedicated to delivering civil services to uh, civil legal services to low-income Americans. <coughs> so you have one lawyer for every 240 non-poor uh, people who might need uh, legal representation. We talk about low-income who may qualify for legal aid. Uh, that's one lawyer for 9,000 uh, potential clients. And that number may be skewed because there are people who are low income but may not meet the uh, requirements for uh, a, 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 a civil appointment. What about uh, 6.2, accepting appointment? If, a lawyer, if the judge said, I want you to be on this case, what, what can you do under 6.2? Say no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Or what? Okay. Yeah. Mr. Martin, sir. Okay. You can define, uh, like, Look it up. You can define the likely that you're going to be violating the rules of professional Okay. Um, now, what, what would, uh, that's good. So, what would a rule be that would violate professional conduct? The rules of professional conduct. Like something that you don't practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. You might say, I, I have a competence problem. I don't practice in this area. Uh, and even to get up to speed would cost, well, it's not even going to cost because that's why you're being appointed as a, uh, an attorney for an indigent client. Uh, so, if you could point to a violation of the law, that would be one thing. Unreasonable financial burden. I mean, you're doing this for free, but in the context of your other cases and your other time, the impact on that would be so unreasonable that it would cost your lawyer a hardship to represent. So, that's another way. Or, uh, the client is so repugnant to the lawyer as to be likely to impair the client-lawyer relationship or the lawyer's ability to represent the client. So that's, remember we were talking about conflicts? That is a, a material limitation. In other words, uh, there's just no way around it. You can't really meet with this person. There's no way that there could even be a collaborative relationship, so you couldn't represent there. So there are instances that both makes the point uh, that you can say, well, you can't accept that appointment. But the, pre the preparatory language is just one to it urges lawyers to accept such appointments, except for good cause. And what we were just talking about were those uh, good cause. Now, what about adequate representation in death penalty cases? And that, that's a real problem. Uh, we've seen cases before where it's sort of sketchy and inconsistent about how uh, people are represented, even when everything is at stake. Uh, and we saw how high the standard was. It's strict and very deferential. Oftentimes, the lawyer's uh, conduct is affirmed as purely strategic. Courts do not want to get into uh, determining how a lawyer should have handled the case. So if it's some baseline competence, the courts are really uh, very deferential. But the book on page 597 even says that it's a mixed and uneven system that lacks level oversight and standards. So there's no uniformity in terms of standards in uh, capital punishment cases. And the only real way to enforce uh, appropriate standards is through uh, ineffective assistance of counsel cases. That pretty much is not the way to do it. And it really sort of points out how uh, deficient representation is. Now, the book makes the point that appellate representation is at a higher level. And that's because you usually don't have uh, just individual attorneys. You have attorneys who are connected to some uh, public interest entity. Uh, like Brian Stevenson, for example. He's not just practicing law. Professor at NYU, and, and he has uh, connections to his own organization, Equal Justice uh, Initiative, uh, and, and, and other entities like that. So appellate work, quite interestingly, is uh, at a higher level. But think about that. You're already at the stage where something has uh, occurred uh, that may have led to a wrongful conviction, you're still uh, in the system, you have to wait for this appeal, and these appeals take years. Now, this is a good review. Look on page 598 as an example there. Uh, he pointed to some things that this lawyer did wrong uh, in terms of the rules that we have talked about before. We have, and he's, there's obviously something a little bit off. You see the picture of him on page 599. That's him uh, defending himself at his disciplinary hearing. He dresses up like Thomas Jefferson. I've seen him too. <laughs> so that's, that's bad. But uh, he represented a, a client on death row, a Philip Chatham, murder trial in Kansas. And notice this. So we have something uh, that we can work with this attorney. His client says, I have an alibi. I was somewhere totally different. I wasn't even in the state, so I could not have committed this murder. Murder happened in Kansas, and he says he was in Chicago. So go through, uh, sort of as a review, go through what this attorney representing a client on death row did that was wrong. I mean, he was ultimately disbarred. So what was the conduct that led to his disbarment? So one, another way to look at it is, uh, if you had to establish an ineffective assistance of counsel claim on behalf of Mr. Chatham, uh, what conduct would you point to in order to say that he's entitled uh, at least to a new trial? Because of what the attorney did. It's a lot there. Some of the stuff I don't even understand why we do it. Yeah, I mean, talking about fair manslaughter convictions and saying he's a shooter of people. Yeah, so that's crazy. So, what, so that's a competency. That's a, sort of a, a graphic illustration of a lack of understanding of evidence. He inserts propensity evidence on his client uh, that allows the jury almost to say, well, even if he didn't do it this time, he did it before. He's that type of person. So he, this criminal defense attorney actively exploits the propensity evidence, which should be prohibited against his own client. That's right one. Anything else? So he incriminated his own client. What, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, now, that's basically, that's the key to the case. Alibi, how do you substantiate that? You do have a phone records. I was in Chicago, not Kansas City, uh, Kansas, uh, and the attorney did not follow up on the alibi, simply because he did not know how to get phone records. 
And maybe that is complex, but you can ask somebody, you can call a phone uh, company, you can do any number of things to try to get these records. So he did follow up on the alibi, he incriminated his own client, he argued that his client should be executed. Yeah. See how he could do that. And on top of that, he charged fifty thousand dollars for doing nothing. So that's one point five, and you know that, that's clearly out of whack uh, for what he did. Not talking about resources, just the general confidence. And then he did something else that is prohibited. He had the client sign a release uh, insulating him from any type of professional responsibility or disciplinary action. And so Chatham, of course, is sentenced to death because of his representation. Uh, but he gets a new trial, finding merit in his claim that he did not have effective assistance of counsel. So notice that that's kind of so bad that it even met the standard for ineffective assistance of counsel when you have uh, the court being very deferential. There's nothing to defer here uh, in terms of the client, in terms of the attorney's judge. There's nothing that we can say is strategic or anything. This is just uh, bright line incompetence. So the book is making the point that representation makes a difference. There's another uh, short example on the top of page 599 uh, where you have a lawyer botching the case because of alcoholism, drinking a quart of vodka every day during the trial. And so, and stealing money from another client, I guess, to support that habit or whatever. Uh, and this attorney, Andy Prince, was disbarred. And even in prison for a few months after the trial. Uh, so, but it seems like even, even with that, uh, the client was sentenced to death and executed in 2014. Now, notice how, how rigid the system is. There's certainly probably some ineffective assistance for counsel there, uh, but the system didn't get to it quick enough, and this person is executed. And then you see a footnote, footnote 34, in deportation hearings. That, that's sort of in line with what we're talking about, civil and administrative hearings, but just making the point that representation makes a difference. So, if you see someone going pro bono, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a bad result, but uh, representation makes a difference. Even in deportation hearings, it says uh, in cases with one of merits, 20% of those were representation one and were not ordered to be deported, compared to only 2% who were unrepresented. So it certainly makes a difference. Now, what about uh, this argument? So we have, even though it's imperfect, uh, recognition that if you're a criminal defendant indigent, you are entitled to uh, representation, constitutionally guaranteed, uh, because the liberty interest is so important. Now, why can't the same argument be made in terms of civil proceedings? And there's been argument back and forth for years about well, why don't we recognize a right to counsel in civil cases uh, based upon a due process clause of the 14th Amendment? What is that a case? Look on page 600. Uh, Robert William Crass. And the case ultimately means the U.S. versus Crass. So here's someone who is fired from their job, and from that, a number of devastating uh, things occur. So impacted financially, can't afford access to uh, courts because of that black haven, uh, pay the fee for bankruptcy to clear his debt and get a fresh start. And so this is sort of an implicit argument that uh, these things are so important that indigent civil defendants should have a right to counsel as well. What does the court do with that argument in U.S. versus Crass? And, and why is there a distinction between divorce cases where it seems like a, a little bit of that right has been recognized and crisis cases where you have some devastating things and all these deaths and everything, but the court says that's a little bit different. The courts have been very uh, reluctant to expand uh, a right to counsel in this area. Very reluctant, you know, from a constitutional law to, to expand a due process guarantee. Yeah, go ahead. I thought it was interesting that yeah. they made such a, like, um, an exception for divorce, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reasoning, I guess, was that uh, marriage is unique and both uh, interest based things important uh, in society, but okay. marriage is the only way, yeah. you know, that we will be. Right. And then, but, but then the next step is that if marriage is so unique that this is the only way to dissolve it, the only avenue is through the courts, so we'll make an exception there because that's the only avenue for resolution. Yeah, go ahead. So is the argument um, for why they don't try to make this for civil cases, uh, is it because, you know, the courts aren't the only avenue for yeah, yeah. Like, the whole reasoning? Yeah, partly. Uh, well, no, two things, I think. One is that it just seems generally that courts are, are really reluctant to expand and recognize this right because then once you do that, that right has to be implemented, it has to be embraced, it has to be substantive. And so we may have the same problem that we have in the criminal law context, like with Gideon versus Rain, right? Yes, we had a constitutional right, uh, but how do we implement it and we fall short? Uh, in a civil context, uh, there is this reluctance because you'd be expanding the right and then how would we implement that? And so uh, the court in the Crass case makes a distinction that divorces can only be resolved through the courts, debt collection and these other life uh, occurrences like a contract dispute or uh, anything that's personal can be resolved in different ways outside of the court. So resolution of them is one thing, but I think primarily what drives it is the liberty interest is so profound and different that courts are willing to accept that there has to be a right to counsel there. Civil seems less less uh, onerous. There isn't uh, the stigmatization that goes with being convicted of a crime. There's a loss of the liberty interest, uh, and there are multiple avenues to resolve these uh, issues. So, uh, and, and I just, along with the way, I've also said there is a clear bright line between uh, criminal blameworthiness uh, and civil disputes. In civil disputes, you don't have uh, the stigmatization of blameworthiness, uh, and so there are other ways to resolve those disputes. And I think the slippery slope argument comes into effect as well. Once we start recognizing these uh, different rights to counsel, where does it end? So we can pick and choose and say, well, divorces are different than uh, welfare benefits or social security benefits. But how do we go draw those lines and how do we limit it? And then what would that right to civil counsel mean? It's hard to go ahead. I, I still cannot watch the reason because they say all these other avenues. Um, Non-deportation hearings, right. the mediation itself is generally done by attorneys or hand mediation, right. like arbitration, to resolve these disputes. Yeah, so their own reasoning goes against it because we're not the only only selling court. There are other civil matters that can play out when you send to court, especially when you're declaring bankruptcy. Uh -huh. Like there, and they have a whole court system that is dedicated to bankruptcy. So how they can say, you know, divorce is like so unique that it's that you know, these all like 
you don't support. That makes a lot of sense. And you have all these counterparts, like you were also saying, you're saying that you're not a company, but that company's all support. Mm -hmm. That's what gets there on launch. Yeah, also, and so I think they try to answer your, your critique, and, and then I don't think they're successful, but it says, however unrealistic the remedy may be in a particular situation, there are other avenues. Uh, so I don't think that their, their distinction holds up either, because divorce is on some level like any number of important events in, in civil life that have to be resolved. Uh, and it shouldn't really depend on uh, sole access to the courts or uh, other remedies. You have to look at uh, what the right is. And, and if you have a right in the criminal context, perhaps you should have a right in the civil context if you don't have a right uh, for access to resolve those, those issues. Uh, so you have on top of page 601, the Constitution requires the point of counsel for innocent civil litigants only when the proceeding without counsel would be fundamentally unfair. So there is a lot of cases that says, we're not recognizing this as a substantive constitutional right, but if we look on the record and say, well, this is an issue of fairness, then counsel should be appointed. And you know what happens when you have that type of right. Very rarely enforced. You see that on top of page 601. So in that case, you have, again, something very important and fundamental. The state was trying to terminate an incarcerated mother's right to child custody. And the Constitution requires appointment of counsel for indigent civil litigants only when the proceeding without counsel would be fundamentally unfair. Now, that's sort of recognizing a due process right, but not uh, fully embracing it. So you're allowing uh, discretionary power to determine whether or not something really is important at play, and then saying that counsel can be appointed. Uh, and as uh, Professor Brody says, uh, very rare. Courts have applied in such a restrictive fashion that counsel is almost never required in civil cases. So there's this argument for civil Gideon, it's called. Now, let's say we're, we are uh, fortunate enough to adopt a civil right to counsel. How do you think that that would be applied and implemented? So I'm asking if we adopt civil Gideon, we have not only a right to counsel in criminal cases, but a right to counsel in civil cases. How would that look and how would we guarantee that constitutional right? Huh? I will say that I can't explain why the court is trying to put that because there are so many different avenues of civil litigation. I think those constitutional legal questions elsewhere, lawyers can specialize in like various of civil litigation, one special tax, one specialized tort, one specialized contracts. It, it would be very hard to like create a public office where, you know, like, you can assign a lawyer to a client who may have problems that's not necessarily a lawyer there that could be. It's not the same as in criminal contracts where a criminal attorney is generally like specializing in all areas of law, whether it be murder, mm -hmm. or something else. So it's implementing it would be difficult and not there's and so and that's good. So we sort of have a system like that, but it's really limited. We have a the Legal Services Corporation, <coughs> page uh, 602, uh, civil legal aid. So uh, people who cannot afford representation in civil cases, there's a network of salary legal aid lawyers who provide advice and representation. So the, the legal aid that we have here and, and other places they may receive money from the Legal Services Corporation uh, that can help with that representation. Uh, and it's the largest, largest single source of funding for civil legal aid for the poor. But the problem is, uh, you know, since the early 90s, administrations have been uh, cutting a budget. There. And the Trump administration even proposed uh, getting rid of it in, in, in its entirety. There was a, a fight about that, but it was managed to be saved. But uh, very limited, and if you look at the, the footnote, footnote 45, uh, very limited in terms of uh, the services that can be provided. So notice there's a conscious effort to limit the scope of representation and to limit uh, proactive uh, efforts by attorneys uh, to impact the law in a positive way for their client. So no real advocacy, no discussion about changing the law, uh, no uh, pure pro bono uh, efforts to reform or uh, revise the federal state welfare system. Uh, so it can't participate in any uh, representation of undocumented uh, uh, immigrants seeking asylum. Uh, no participation in class action. So there's a big uproar about that because that is the, one of the major avenues to uh, initiate major societal change and, and they're prohibited from doing that. So uh, that is, is a problem. But well, what do you think this civil right would look like? So you have sort of a, a network of uh, legal aid attorneys, law clinics like the one that we have, they do a little bit of the work. So there's a law school uh, clinics contribute about $3 million a year. And that's worth about $150 million uh, to uh, uncompensated service for poor people. But there still is a huge gap between uh, the representation that's uh, provided and what is needed in society. Uh, and also, it's an interesting thing with uh, law clinics. Uh, you, you, you can take on good cases, but if you are sort of in the context of a university, uh, there could be a pushback if you take on, quote, the wrong type of client. Say you have someone on the board trustee and they don't like this type of client or this particular cause. Uh, there could be pushback. And then you have all of the uh, conflicts issues that we're, we're talking about here. Our independent judgment, how do we represent clients? Should we let a third party, even though we work for that third party, interfere in the representation? Uh, of, the, of the client. So all those things are real. That's on page 603. Now look at rule uh, 6.1. Voluntary public service. And so we really have to cover this because uh, we're one of the first schools in the nation to require uh, public service. And so we do it academically, but then when we discuss it in real life, uh, there's some practical implications. And there's always been this discussion about uh, mandatory pro bono service. And it's never passed. We get up to start talking about it, and then uh, the legal profession says no. So the way that Rule 6.1 is set up is aspirational. This is what something that we want you to shoot for as a as a lawyer. Voluntary <coughs> public service. So someone take you through 6.1, tell me what it says and what you would have to do as a newly admitted attorney. This is okay, 604. So one thing. Like a lot of the rules that we have here, it starts off mandatory, uh, but oftentimes ends up discretionary. It says this, every lawyer, so it doesn't say shall, but it says has a professional responsibility to 
provide legal services. And those are able to pay. So how does the rule say you can do that? Yeah, how does the rule say you can do that? And so, you look at the comment. So every lawyer, apart from social position or professional prominence, has a responsibility to provide legal services to those unable to pay. ABA urges all lawyers to provide a minimum of 50 hours. And this is uh, aspirational. What about that? Let me understand. Go ahead. Okay, so it is aspirational. I'm <laughs> well, it, it, it will happen. This is this is possible. There have been several attempts to say, look, we can. It's only fifty hours. We'll make it mandatory, uh, and then the, the discussion starts going, and then there's this huge pushback, and then the ABA says, okay, it was just an idea. And so uh, it, it happens. It's happened many times. I, I don't have any real hope that it'll, it'll ever be mandatory because we're sort of independent. And some people make the argument: How can you tell me to practice law? You're compelling me to do this, and this is sort of uh, you know touchy feely, uh, nice uh, stuff, and, and this doesn't really have anything to do with practicing law. But it, it should be a component of uh, practice. Uh, and that's what the rule is trying to get at, but uh, you're, you're right, what, what's the purpose? Well, it's sort of a signpost that this is something we would like you to do, we you know that there's difficulty making it mandatory, so we'll make it aspirational. Yes, go ahead. I don't understand why it's difficult to make it mandatory, because, and so I actually, I actually push back, tell them not having a lack of wanting to do it, it's telling them a lack of having behind it, because already in constant discussion, especially like in the market, we are doing this like, over the caseloads. So where are you supposed to find a lack of the same kind of level of confidence, confidence uh, representation when you're doing public service? Because you want to give just as much confidence, you want to have just as much confidence when you're like, doing service for like, a charity or, or an organization like that, as you do when you're when you might represent, you know, in a private litigation. So, so tell me what you're saying about standards. So if, even if you're not paying for it, what are you saying about it? If it's, like, if it's made in this right, and we're already overburdened, then the standards are going to have to logically be lower for one setting than they are for another. And generally, the way that how we play out is that it's going to be lower for any public service setting than it is for a private That's true. So you think that uh, making it aspirational, that a lawyer is going to sort of self-select the type of cases he or she wants to do for no charge, uh, and the level of expertise and confidence will be the same because the lawyer chose to be involved in that rather than being compelled to do that? I, I think that would be the ideal, the ideal of scenario, yes. Okay. So Matt, go ahead. I was going to say, I can see it being more difficult for people in private practice. But some firms that do billable hours will actually let you count for 50 billable hours towards your, your billable hours. Right. It makes, gives you a real incentive because you can pick whatever you want to do. Um, right. And then still have a count for your billable right. hours. Mm -hmm. so. and, and a lot of firms, I know, I practice in the Stone Ages, but, uh, <laughs> but even then, our firm had a, there was a partner who, he, his whole line was pro bono. And so, and, and they treated it as a, a regular case, no, uh, no diminution of what we would do on that case, and that was your time that I billed that time at the public interest time. So uh, I did a school desegregation case in Alabama. They let me leave for like a month, uh, and I worked with the uh, NAACP, uh, and I was just, you know, civil rights law was just something that was developing then for me, but uh, that was my pro bono work. And so it was billed the same way uh, as regular work, only we weren't charging uh, the NAACP or anything for my time. So that's, that's the way that major firms do it. They, they, they will even have a partner who, that is what he does, and it shows that how, how serious it is taken. So uh, there are ways to do it. Uh, but well, I think the problem that you run into is uh, when you mandate something, we can sort of push back at the rules being imposed upon it. So uh, that uh, is where we are. Notice in the chapter, it's difficult to ascertain how many lawyers meet or see the ABA's aspirational 50 hour standard for pro bono work. And so there was a survey in 2012 that showed that lawyers averaged about 56 hours uh, of pro bono service per year. And the median number was about 30. So when you have something like this and it's not mandated as part of our, our licensing, then uh, that's probably what you're going to get. But you see that. There are also guidelines about how much of this 50 hours should be devoted to uh, people of limited means. We use some of this language, of, if I recall correctly, uh, in terms of determining placements that we do for our own public service uh, program. So you, you have uh, persons of limited means. You have uh, uh, civil rights, civil liberties. Public organizations. You know, specific causes like the First Amendment. Environment. So it's an aspirational guideline also with uh, suggestions about where that time should be spent. You see that uh, on page 604. <coughs> now, look at this problem. So you have on page 609 a full, uh, Professor Rody is probably the expert in terms of a legal profession and pro bono work and the structure of the legal system. So that's why she figures so prominently in this discussion. But on page 609, you have arguments pro and con uh, for mandatory pro bono. And so so in favor, we have special privileges. We're the only one who, are provide, who can provide these legal services. We're highly specialized, and we should share our talents to open up uh, legal access to uh, disadvantaged communities. We have special responsibilities to improve society. 
exposes lawyers to ways that the legal system fails, and maybe we can improve that if we know that it impacts people who have little or no power, and it benefits lawyers by providing valuable training. Now again, the, the valuable training argument is great, but you can't use that as, uh, well, this is a second level type of case, and we'll just let a junior associate uh, work on this because that junior associate will get experience and we're not charging them anyway. That, that isn't the approach. It has to be treated like, this is just like our regular line of work. We want you to build skills in diverse practice areas, and we want you to be able to understand diverse communities that may be part of your clientele. That's important. So those are all the arguments in favor. And then the argument uh, against uh, something, some people say compulsory, a uh, charity is a contradiction in terms. In other words, in order for this service to be meaningful, it must be voluntary and not compel. Cannot compel altruism. Uh, other occupations don't have uh, set requirements. Grocers are not required to feed poor people. Uh, forced labor is involuntary servitude. That's pretty extreme. Uh, <laughs> most lawyers would have made a pro bono requirement by providing free service to middle class individuals, including friends, and to institutions such as museums and churches. That's interesting. That's sort of partially, but, but notice it's sort of a certain type of clientele, not the clientele that really needs it. Museums and charitable boards, they have uh, access to counsel. Uh, forcing corporate lawyers who are not trained in poverty law or in how to relate to low income individuals will result in incompetent service. That's only true if you treat it that way. I mean, if you start from the uh, presumption that this is lower level representation, that's what you're going to get. You say you should be adequately trained. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you say that you're going to be adequately trained, that's part of being a, a full, uh, fully practicing lawyer. Uh, and then finally, requiring all attorneys to contribute minimal services of largely unverifiable, unverifi unverifiable quality cannot begin to satisfy these nations on that legal need, but may reflect uh, public attention for more productive ways of addressing it. Uh, so that's sort of the process procedure neutrality argument. Uh, and it's also a slippery slope argument that if we start doing this, we have to do more and more. But then you sort of have to start somewhere. So that's part of it. So that leads us to this problem. Uh, problem 13 on mandatory pro bono service. So this is, a, this is interesting, because this, this happened. So I was talking about the discussion that we have. You know, it starts every, every 10 years or so, we have should, uh, this be a mandatory pro bono. I'm sure, uh, like around the presidential election or, or a little bit after, we're going to start this discussion again. It never fails. Uh, and so the question is, should we have mandatory pro bono service? So this really happens. Each, each year, three law students are elected to serve as members of the House of Delegates to the ADA. And the ADA, is, this is the highest governing body. This is where policy comes from. So these rules that we've been studying, at one point they were circulating to a committee, then it goes to the House of Delegates, and it's voted on, and then uh, it's, it's uh, sent out to the states as model rules. Uh, so, and then we had ADA Ethics uh, 2000. And there was a divided debate about making pro bono service mandatory. That proposal has been, notice what the problem says, that proposal has been brought up once again, so this is nothing new. An ADA committee has recommended that Rule 6.1 be amended to make service mandatory with a 25 hour buyout. $25 per hour buyout. I guess you'd be 25 times 50 and you could buy yourself out of there. Uh, and the House of Delegates is scheduled to vote on this matter. How will you vote and why? <coughs> will you vote for a mandatory pro bono service? Notice that you would be in, imposing another requirement on you and we'd have to set up a framework for monitoring that because we make it mandatory, it would have to be meaningful. It can't be like it is now aspirational and we don't know uh, how much lawyers uh, spend on it because we have to do surveys and those surveys may not be readily verified. So I just want to, I, I don't really have an answer, but I wanted to ask about the buyout. Where does the money go? Who do you pay? Do you pay the ABA? Well, I guess if, if they set it up that way, that maybe the ABA as part of dues, but I think in order to make it really work, it would probably have to be connected to some state bar association, and then you set up some type of monitoring, and then that money would go into a pool for uh, legal okay. education and maybe pro bono efforts. So okay. that, that would be something that would have to be determined. If you make something mandatory, uh, that would be how you implement it. So to one or two places, maybe the ABA, but that wouldn't reach everybody because not everybody's a member of the ABA. It's probably more through a state bar association. We'd have to come up with a set of rules to implement it, and then a reporting system, and then a, a collecting system. But that shouldn't stop us from pursuing it. So what do you think? Should we have mandatory pro bono? Come back to you. Uh, I guess I'm insured, yeah. But um, I mean, they can make they make a lot of stuff mandatory that we don't want to do, right? So all they have to do is just say, yeah, right? So I don't get why it's really a problem to, to me. If they wanted to do it, they could do it. Oh, well, right. they, yeah, they could do it, but you could have uh, a profession enough. Well, they would have done it already if it was that easy, first of all. And yeah. every time they try to do it. Uh, so they don't want to do it, right? Well, to do it would be controversial because you get pushback and all the arguments that we talked about. But the major argument is you're compelling me to do another different thing. I've already satisfied all the standards of competent education, passed the bar, passed the NPRE, and now you're telling me uh, I have to do this. And, and, and you're telling me about the scope of my representation. I should be able to pick and choose my clients. Uh, and not have to uh, be compelled to do so. So this whole argument about mandatory service is what uh, gets the pushback. So yes, they can do it, uh, but there's an instrumental question as well. If they did, it would it be effective? And the answer is probably not if you have the entire bar sort of uh, split and divided about whether or not to do it. Yes, what? Right. Can you mandate the hours and how mandate the fields that, that I would have to be like, specialized in? I mean, I have the argument right there. So if you have to compromise, you have to make the hours mandatory, they say, wait, let's just help people that you can do with it. I mean. Okay, tell, that's good. tell me how that would work. So you, you have to do 50, mm -hmm. and it has to be something like public interest, but, but how would we make sure that people who have unmet needs are met? So that, so that would be, that's interesting. So it wouldn't look that mandatory. It would be more like a requirement of these 50 hours. I practice in this area anyway, and if I can identify clients in my client base, and I can do that, I'll check off my 50 hours. So, so even if uh, I work at a corporate firm, and maybe uh, a public interest organization or a charitable organization comes to me, we really can't pay your fee, you do, okay, I'll do it, and then that can be part of my 50 hours. Right, I think, I mean, I also have to facilitate, like, collaboration on the legal community, which I don't think is ever a bad idea. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just talking about 
I'm glad. That's good. But, so, uh, but then, don't you have a little problem though? So, if, okay. and, and I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I'm here for this. So, so, uh, so I'm not casting this person at any major firm or anything. So let's just say a major a downtown firm, and they want to adopt your approach. It's not really compulsion, it's a requirement. We have some clients who don't, can't really pay or don't really pay. Uh, but the type of clients that we will run into, maybe it's like the art museum or the zoo or the orchestra. And, and that's fine and good, that's public interest. Uh, but what about the unmet need that we're also talking about? The truly disadvantaged client who needs representation in civil matters. How does your uh, solution work in that context? So I think those, I think, I think it bounces down. Yeah. Not, every, not every firm is a corporate firm. Right. Not every firm specializes in that. So there is a lot of unmet need. It's unrelated to the thing that we're going to ever be all of, all of, the, all of that. But um, I think it's interesting, like, you know, the corporations that you talked about with the zoo, I think they are like, they're kind of interesting. And they offer things to people. Look, if they're not represented, then we're not offering society with the things that those organizations offer. So I think even that, like, even though that's kind of like, casting a little bit of doubt possibly on my I think more than anything, it reaffirms that like every specialization like um, has this type of work that it can do, and that it provides to society either directly or directly. Okay, that's good. And so somebody, you shouldn't feel bad, like some, something like a library. We really need, right. like that main library downtown is, is much more than a library. It's, you know, not for somebody else, but when you can get access to computers, data, some people spend their day there, to all the people who really are transient. Uh, so it's a, it's a true public space. So representation there uh, is uh, beneficial as well. And also maybe if you have this mix, you'll have small and middle uh, sized farms that would take up the, the slack. So they will be representing people who might say, well, I can't really afford this. Uh, and you can do it that way as well. And they'll have more civil things that really need attention that attacks to that liberty as well. Social security unit, uh, custody unit, all those different things that uh, impact major avenues of life. Just sorry. I'd love what you say. The only issue I have with it is still that I was on earlier time constraints. Yes. Pay close that we already that we're already going to have cross what subdivision we're in. Have still having that time requirement. And yes, there's plenty of ways that you know, if you work in a big law firm that has that sort of billion hour uh, factor in, right. it'd be okay. But for people who have are like private practice or in smaller law firms, they might not have that luxury. And if they're already overburdened with cases in the private context, then having to spend so much more time to go like public that's not that's not only like again, kind of messing with standards of it. That that could also be detrimental to the lawyer themselves because I think there's like literally no time left for them to take care of themselves to make sure they have to continue to get help from the Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's your point. Do you think that the case law problem is as stark as it is on the criminal side, or are we talking about a different sort of body of case? That's something to consider case law and management. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so I think I'm a lot of cynical. Yes, that's good. So I think I, <laughs> like, wait, I, I worked for one of the firms a long time ago that felt like it was so involuntary because they're huge, and they'd get really angry about having to do their pro bono hours, and that was, you know, I mean, we all are others, so that's why I ever enjoyed the system here. But that being said, I think people like that are the firms that find ways to get around it, and they don't want to really serve people for organizations they care about, because we aren't interested in it. So I feel like it's aspirational, mm -hmm. but personally, I'm like, oh my god, this is not going to be There's a value of being, it being voluntary, uh, because of the effort that would be uh, involved if an attorney's picking what he or she is going to be involved in, uh, also the level of skill, also the time, uh, and so when you oppose something, and, and also when it's voluntary, it's more like it's just one of the regular cases that you're taking on, so the same level of skill and requirement. So I understand that. That's the uh, institutional structural argument that uh, if you compel something, uh, there's going to be pushback, and you're going to get you're going to get what you really, you're going to get unintended circumstances, uh, unintended consequences, because you hope to do something well, but there'll be pushback, and that can undermine the type of representation that you get. So also, uh, they would, they have to be required to do it anyway, right. like, so they essentially would hold that level of yeah. And those are kind of clients that, uh, that might be one pain, but there was some other type of benefit down the line that, yeah, or the connection or something like that. And so, and you can't really quantify that, so they're not looking at anything. That's interesting. It's more yes, ma'am. I'm kind of going to go around and say that it would be too far fetched to the requirements that they're going to keep within the Senate program, but if you do for a long hours, okay. like when you read, like, yep, people go online, but the lawyers can kind of keep the lawyer heads. So, how would that, yeah? Mm -hmm. How would you get lawyers interested in that, though? graduation will work with uh, attorneys if you do this certain amount of hours you get this certain recognition or what do you think? No. no. Thank you.